Hello everyone, Dr Polaris here. Just 12 miles from Oxford in the UK lies the small village of Stonesfield. Sitting atop seams of Jurassic limestone, Stonesfield was once home to an early 19th century quarry that supplied Oxfordshire houses with roof tiles. As the workers dug down into the earth, they would occasionally find strange fragmentary fossilised bones that seemed to belong to large extinct animals unlike any still alive at that time. Many of these fossils found their way into the collections of Oxford University, where they garnered the attention of wealthy gentlemen scholars. One of the men most fascinated by such discoveries was William Buckland, Oxford University's first reader in the then fairly young science of geology. Buckland was particularly interested in some large fossil remains recovered from the Stonesfield Quarry, which consisted of several vertebrae, a femur, and a section of jawbone complete with sharp serrated teeth. Buckland did not know what kind of animals these had come from, but in 1818, after the Napoleonic Wars, the French comparative anatomist Georges Cuvier visited Buckland in Oxford and realised that the bones belonged to a huge reptilian creature. Cuvier suggested that this mighty beast must have measured about 12 metres or 39 feet long, being a veritable dragon of the ancient world. Buckland and his associates continued to study these remains, deciding in 1822 to give this prehistoric predator the scientific name of Megalosaurus, essentially meaning Big Lizard. On the 20th of February 1824, at a meeting of the Geological Society of London, Buckland was ready to announce officially his findings to the broader scientific community. Thus, Megalosaurus became the first dinosaur to be scientifically described as such, although at this early stage, the term dinosaur had not yet entered the academic lexicon. Buckland saw the animal as belonging to the group Sauria, which is an outdated category once thought to contain both lizards and crocodiles. As such, the earliest fully realised depictions of Megalosaurus, which were not even produced by Buckland, but instead by artist John Martin under the supervision of Gideon Mantell, showed the ancient reptile to be an enormous dragon-like monster I've covered Martin's 1838 painting, known as The Country of the Iguanodon, in an older video on the early history of Paleoart, so I won't repeat myself too much here. The painting shows a tropical prehistoric landscape, wherein the three known genera that would later define the clade Dinosauria, Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and Hyliosaurus, are rendered in violent combat, which was typical for Regency period artwork showcasing the natural world. Other images produced by Martin for the 1838 book The Wonders of Geology are similar, depicting Megalosaurus as a massive, sluggish, lizard-like animal. However, Buckland's formal description of Megalosaurus had already noted that the genus was quite different from modern reptiles, pointing out that it would have had legs held directly underneath the body. Megalosaurus was also estimated to be far larger than any modern reptile with Buckland imagining an overall length of 60 to 70 feet, which led to the more well-known images of the genus produced by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in the 1850s. These showed a heavily built quadrupedal reptilian predator with erect limbs, a crocodile-like head and a bear-like body, complete with a long dragging tail. This interpretation of Megalosaurus can still be seen in model form at Crystal Palace Park in London. For many people, a huge reptile with wicked looking teeth conflicted with their literal interpretation of the Bible, with the lion lying down with the lamb, and all animals living in a peaceable kingdom before Adam's fall. Buckland was a good enough naturalist to reject the ridiculous idea that Megalosaurus was a vegetarian with those sharp slashing teeth. An idea also revived by modern day creationists, who claim that Tyrannosaurus rex used its sharp teeth to feed on coconuts and melons. Instead, Buckland proposed that God had assigned to Megalosaurus the benign role of getting rid of old and sick animals to, quote, diminish the aggregate amount of animal suffering, unquote. Interestingly, this would not be the first time that the remains of Megalosaurus were interpreted through the lens of Genesis. In fact, the earliest potential fossil of the genus, from the Tainton limestone formation, was the lower part of a femur, discovered in the 17th century. It was originally described by naturalist Robert Plott as the thigh bone of a Roman war elephant, and later a biblical giant. Plott included an illustration of the now lost fossil in his 1676 book Natural History of Oxfordshire, 
which was the oldest accurate drawing of a dinosaur bone. This first known dinosaur was also given a truly inappropriate name. In 1763, Richard Brooks republished Plot's illustration and called the fossil Scrotum Humanum. In addition, the form of Brooks's name suggests the genus and species binomial naming system devised by Carl Linnaeus in 1758, which was initially used not only for animals and plants, but also for natural curiosities found in rock. In 1970, the eccentric British paleontologist Lambert Beverly Holstead published an article suggesting that the first named dinosaur should probably be called Scrotum Humanum instead of Megalosaurus. Later paleontologists asked the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature to formally suppress the name Scrotum Humanum. The commission ruled that this was unnecessary because the name was only published in a caption without adequate description or diagnosis, that the original specimen was lost, and it was not certain that it was the same as Megalosaurus. Thus, Scrotum Humanum was abandoned, although part of me wishes that it wasn't, purely for comedy purposes. By 1842, Richard Owen had united Megalosaurus with two other discoveries, Iguanodon and Hyliosaurus, to create the taxon Dinosauria. Owen conceived of dinosaurs as being active super reptiles, with the smaller modern forms supposedly being their degenerate descendants. Owen's vision of these ancient reptiles maintained that they were obligate quadrupeds, much like large modern mammals. The presumption that carnivorous dinosaurs, like Megalosaurus, were quadrupeds was first challenged by the description of Compsonathus in 1859. That, however, was a very small animal, the significance of which for the gigantic forms could be debated. In 1870, also near Oxford, the type specimen of Eustreptospondylus was discovered, which was the first reasonably intact skeleton of a large theropod, and it was clearly a bipedal animal. During the 1870s, North American discoveries of large theropods such as Allosaurus confirmed that they were bipedal beyond all doubt. The modern view of Megalosaurus is that it was a medium-sized theropod that was native to what is now the UK during the Bathonian stage of the Middle Jurassic, between 166 and 165 million years ago. No complete remains of this genus have ever been found, which has meant that its overall size is somewhat debatable, with estimates usually ranging between 6 and 8 metres, or generally up to 25 to 30 feet long or so. Megalosaurus gives its name to the family Megalosauridae, which were a fairly successful group of theropods during the second half of the Jurassic, becoming extinct at the end of the period. Megalosaurus has been found to be a close relative of the larger Torvosaurus, which was native to both Europe and North America, as well as to Duria venata. It was a relatively robust and heavily built animal that probably weighed in the region of one metric ton, being the apex predator in its environment. During the Bathonian, Europe consisted of a scattered archipelago of warm tropical islands, somewhat like the Caribbean today. Megalosaurus would probably have shared its shoreline ecosystem with a variety of other non-avian dinosaurs, including the sauropod Cetiosaurus, the aforementioned Duria venata, the small, potentially basal Tyrannosauroid Proceratosaurus, and indeterminate Paravians, Stegosaurs, and Ankylosaurs. Overall, despite being an animal of incredible importance to the study of paleontology, Megalosaurus remains a somewhat obscure and poorly understood genus, partly due to the fragmentary nature of its remains, and the fact that it is sometimes seen as a fairly generic medium-sized theropod. Megalosaurids are, in my opinion, underappreciated and not generic at all, having a number of interesting anatomical traits, being deserving of a future video in their own right. Megalosaurus itself has been featured in popular culture a few times, including in the opening to the Dickens novel Bleak House, and as Earl Sinclair, the so-called Mighty Megalosaurus and patriarch of the Sinclair family in the Jim Henson-produced Dinosaurs TV show from the early 90s, which I never grew up with, but have found myself really enjoying as an adult due to the surprisingly clever and cynical writing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Freddy, you gotta see this puppet show, it's terrific. Uh -huh. Oh, that's for kids. Yeah, you'd think that because they're puppets. So the show seems to have a children's aesthetic. Yet the dialogue is unquestionably sharp-edged, witty, and thematically skewed to adults. 
It's honestly quite depressing that many of the show's satirical takedowns of politics, corruption, and environmental destruction are just as relevant today, if not more so, than when the show first aired over 30 years ago. I think you're missing the point, sir. The world may be coming to an end. Well, that's a fourth quarter problem. We'll drop a bomb on that bridge when we come to it. Right now, my biggest problem is trying to figure out what to do with all this money. <laughs> But hey, at least we didn't get Earl the mighty scrotum humanum. Thanks for watching everyone. Have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, or whatever you celebrate in late December. And I'll be back in the new year with an appropriately wintry episode, focused on the animals of the early Cretaceous Yixian formation. See you again soon. Cheerio.